The Lord be with you. And also with you. I invite you to turn with me now in your copy of Holy Scripture to the third chapter of Paul's epistle to the Philippians. It's uh, Philippians chapter 3. We're going to begin with the second half of verse 4 and read on through verse 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the sharing of His sufferings by becoming like Him in this death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, we pray that we hear what you would have us to hear. Lord, that we may do what you call us to do, that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As I am reminded pretty often, uh, I'm not old, and a lot of other folks are. I'm at that age now where it seems like so many of my mentors, my teachers, my Elder exemplars are reaching transitions in their own lives. Some of them are retiring. I'm actually friends with my sixth grade teacher on Facebook, which is a weird thing to say. But last month, I received an email inviting me to reception for my favorite seminary professor, Dr. Laylee Nan. after her 23 years of teaching Old Testament and Christian scriptures at Truett Seminary. I remember when I got the email, I thought, she's already retiring? I was just there 10 years ago, and she had been teaching for 23. Some of them have moved on to new adventures, to new places, like my mentor and pastor in college, Dennis. He had served the church where I was there with him for about 10 years, and then a couple, few years ago, I got a, a phone call, said he was leaving to go to another church a few states away, to be in a different context, in a different location. And then there are those who have made the final transition, those whose faces and voices I'll only be able to see and hear by way of recording and recollection, at least on this side of eternity. Some of them were relational influences, people I knew directly, whose funerals I attended, whose memorial services I may have been a part of. But there are many who I only knew through their work and their words, their influence undeniable in my life to those who knew the both of us. And one that always comes to my mind this time of year is the late Fred Craddock, a name no doubt you've heard me say once or twice from this pulpit. Dr. Craddock, I think it's not too much to say, single-handedly reshaped the reality of preaching in the 20th century. He pulled the pulpit out of the dour doldrums of three alliterative points of corny jokes and threadbare poems. The shelves in my office are heavy with books either by Fred Craddock, for Fred Craddock, or about Fred Craddock. 
And there's a measurable amount of space on my computer and in various thumb drives and on CDs that contain his sermons, his lectures, and my own papers written about him and his work. Craddock died four years ago during Lent in March of 2015. And what's interesting about that to me is that this giant of preaching, this colossus of the pulpit, who was ironically a rather short and whimsical looking fellow, when he died, the only request he had about his funeral was that there'd be no sermon, no eulogy at his funeral. Tom Long, who preceded him as the bandy professor of preaching at Candler at Emory, said, well, you can imagine why. In his life, he's probably heard some 70,000 sermons. He'd like a break. But all he wanted at his funeral was singing. But as it so often goes with funerals, sometimes the wishes of the living overrule those of the departed. And so Dr. Long gave a veiled eulogy and some remarks during the service. Now, it wasn't a very long speech, and for Fred's sake, I won't call it a sermon, but what struck me most about what Tom Long said about Dr. Craddock was not the things he said, but what he didn't say. There was no mention of Craddock's undergraduate work, no mention of his master's degrees, no mention of his Ph.D. from Vanderbilt New Testament, which is not an easy feat, particularly in the 1960s when he earned it. He didn't mention the numerous lectures that Craddock had been asked to, to deliver, not the least of which were the Lyman Beecher lectures at Yale, which is sort of like the Hall of Fame for those of us who preach. Long only mentioned one of Craddock's books, his groundbreaking as one without authority, but he never mentioned any of his countless articles, his commentaries, other works Craddock had published in his life. In fact, you could say that the words that Tom Long shared at Craddock's memorial would have been the right opposite of the sorts of words that would have been shared in an introduction of Fred Craddock at one of those important lectures. He didn't mention any of those things. He talked about Fred as a husband and a father. He told anecdotes about Braves games and lunches shared. I suppose that's because when the time comes and all the words you've had to say have been said, when all the words you've had to write have been written, when all the degrees, accolades, and honors are taken off their nails and the hooks in your office, when the time comes for somebody to say some words over you in front of a few gathered friends and family, I guess you'll hope they'll talk about the real important stuff, the stuff that actually mattered, and leave the rest of that to memory. I sort of get the idea that that's what Paul is driving at a bit in this letter to his beloved Philippians. If anyone, he says, has reason to be confident in the flesh, if anybody's got any room to brag, it's me. In fact, I have more reason than anybody else. Circumcised on the eighth day, like a good Jewish boy should, not putting it off till you got time in the calendar on day nine or ten, not doing it early to get it out of the way in the hospital before coming home. Paul says on the eighth day, like you're supposed to, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the well-known, easily identifiable, dare we say, elite tribes of Israel. Right now, think about it. You don't have to say it out loud. Name the 12 tribes of Israel. If you know any of them, Benjamin's probably one of them. A Hebrew born of Hebrews. Now, this is an interesting thing. Paul is saying, at our house growing up, we spoke the language of the old country. Not this newfangled Aramaic. We didn't let the Gentile influences of Latin and Greek come in the house. When I was raised, we spoke Hebrew, like any God-fearing child should. A Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, he says, a Pharisee, a dirty word to us Christians. But in Paul's day, a Pharisee was a group of lay leaders that prided themselves not only on knowing the Torah, the first five books of Scripture, the law, but knowing the rest of it, the writings, the prophets, and all the stuff that surrounded it. If you thought you knew the Bible, you didn't know a Pharisee. As to zeal, Paul says, a persecutor of the church. You don't have to read far in Acts to see that was true. While the other Jews who were sitting around in the first century saw this rabble-rousing band of Christians and said, they're starting trouble, I think they might be blasphemers, but let them alone. Paul said, no, we've got to stop them. 
And he persecuted the church. And then he says, as to righteousness under the law. This is loaded. He says, blameless. Now, given everything Paul has said so far, he does not take that statement lightly. He's not just throwing this out there to say, I was the best one, as if he got blue ribbons every time they came around. As to the law, as to righteousness, blameless. Paul doesn't say that lightly. He's got a pedigree. A CV to be envious of for sure. Yet, Paul says, I love when that happens in the Bible. Yet, or but, or well, that's my translation. Yet, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, Paul says, I regard Some of those things, some of the things, uh, a few of the things, no. I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul has an impeccable resume, a flawless record. When it comes right down to it, there were few, if any, who would have had the room to argue with Paul when it came to deserving the title of most likely to get in. If there had been a line lined up for entry into heaven, Paul would have been at the front or maybe even taking roll. But, Paul says, when it came right down to it, when it was all laid on the table in front of him, Paul said, I regard everything, everything is lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Absolutely nothing else mattered. Nothing else came close. Nothing else combined with everything else came close for Paul. Everything Paul had achieved in his life was rendered worthless in the light of who Christ was for Paul. That's why he goes on, For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, or rather, the faith of Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the sharing of His suffering by becoming like Him in His death if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now think about that for a minute. That's a lot of words. What Paul is saying here, think about what he's saying here. He says, I have suffered the loss of all things. Now, when I first read that, and maybe you do too, I think that, oh, poor Paul lost his house, his furniture. They repoed the pickup. It's all gone. But it's more than that. Paul is blameless, a good Jew. There wasn't a party Paul didn't get invited to. Not once did Paul show up at the door of the synagogue and someone say, no, sir, you can't come in here. Not once did Paul show up at the temple for feast days and festivals. Did someone say, I'm not so sure about you, Paul. I don't think you're clean. I don't think you're right. I don't think you get in. Not once was Paul ever not in the privileged position. He didn't just give up everything he had. Think about it now. Paul, suddenly the zealot of, for, of against persecuting the church, now all of a sudden preaching Jesus, talking about Jesus. Do you think they let him in the synagogue now? Do you think when he shows up at Thanksgiving dinner that mom and dad meet him at the door and say, come on in, son, you've caused us no problems, no worries? No. Paul didn't just give up palace and patio. He gave it all up. His privilege, his relationships, all of it. He goes on to say, I regard them as rubbish. Not of content, not out of because he just, you know how you do. Maybe when you were a kid, surely you don't do it as an adult. Somebody says, well, I don't want to play. Well, I didn't want to play with you either. That's not what it is. It's because he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And then he says, 
the sharing of his suffering by becoming like him in his death. Do, do what now? The sharing of his suffering by becoming like him. Paul's words seem to be a bit contrary to some of the things I was once taught about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I mean, yeah, you're supposed to put your old ways behind you, at least the old ways that were identifiably bad, like cussing and drinking and fighting, you know, all those sorts of things. And yes, you were supposed to regard those ways as garbage while you carry on and learning more about Jesus and more about the Scriptures. But sharing in Christ's suffering? I honestly don't remember much, if anything, about that. Faith was always something spun positively, something that had a warm, sunny glow around it. The faith I had been taught was all Easter Sunday in a pinch, just a pinch of Good Friday. But here's Paul wanting to know, wanting to share in the sufferings of Christ after casting aside an otherwise blameless past. But Paul's no masochist deriving some sort of pleasure from suffering, nor does he seek martyrdom as some sort of superimposed self-righteousness. The early church was full of these sort of folks. I'll die for Jesus and I'll get the bigger mansion, the shinier gold street. I'll get to sit closer to Jesus if I die as a martyr. That's not Paul. For Paul, sharing in the suffering of Christ is all about knowing Christ about sharing in the intimacy of knowing the way of the one who has died to make himself known to us. Can I tell you something? That's a hard thing. Because I don't know about you, there are those moments, early in the morning, kids are gone, Sally's at work, I'm sitting on the front porch, a good book, a cup of coffee, even my clothes fit right. Temperature's good. Breeze is just real nice. And I think, man, can you get any closer to God than this? And yet God was never closer to us than in the pain and the suffering of the cross. Paul is not out to to self-mutilate himself. Paul is not out to gain pain for the sake of, of wearing it like a badge of honor. Paul wants to know Jesus. He wants to share in his suffering to know Christ deeply. And the same is true about his longing to attain resurrection from the dead. I want to know the power of his resurrection, the sharing of his suffering, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, Paul says. But again, this longing for resurrection isn't simply wanting an antidote for death. It's about longing to know Christ. To be close to Jesus in ways that go simply beyond recognizing his name or telling his stories. It's Paul's ultimate goal. And I would argue it's all believers' ultimate goal to know Christ this way. But it's not a goal we achieve. It's not a place where we arrive. It's one, it's a goal towards which we are always striving. Hence Paul's words, Not that I've already obtained this or have already reached the goal. If anybody would have, it would have been Paul. Not just because of his background, not just because of his pedigree, but you don't get that kind of background, you don't get that kind of pedigree unless you're the kind of person who pursues it relentlessly. And if anybody would have gotten it, it would have been Paul. But he says, I haven't. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. This life of faith, Paul says, is is so much more than just transactions. So much more than a list of accomplishments or successful prohibitions. It's the ever onward call of pursuing Christ. Of pursuing a deeper, fuller, richer relationship with God in Christ. It's an ongoing pursuit. Not something we accomplish. It's something towards which we are always striving, hopefully growing closer with each day. Paul says, Beloved, I do not consider that I've made it on my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, 
I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Forget all that stuff on my resume. Forget all the things I've done. Forget all of that. I press on for the singular goal of the call of Christ. And here we are, entering the final days of Lent. As Good Friday and Easter Sunday loom ominous on our horizons, may we be especially mindful of what lies ahead, choosing to let go of what lies behind. May we let go of those things which we believe set us apart and above anyone else. That's what Paul does. That's what Paul calls us to do. May we strive to know Christ more fully by longing to experience His suffering. Suffering even at the hands of those we love. Even at the hands of those who may hate us. Those who God calls us to ultimately see as friends, sisters, and brothers. In spite of the suffering. May we strive towards the goal of resurrection, not so we may cheat death, but so we may know that Jesus is who He says He is. That we may know Jesus all the more, not so that we may escape this life, but so that we may embrace eternal life even now. Above all else, may we press on Press ever on in this life of faith, striving to, be, striving to be all of who God calls us to be, pressing on to make it the goals of Christ our own, because Christ Jesus has made us his own. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, even now, you call us through the words of the Apostle Paul to leave behind all those things behind us and to press ever on to know you more. Lord, to experience who you are, your suffering, your resurrection, your life, and your love. Help us, God, to take hold of that this morning. That beginning even now, the breath already in our lungs, to let go of what lies behind us, and to press on towards what you have for us ahead. Be with us now, Holy Spirit. Stir among us and within us, helping us, Lord, to answer whatever call it is you place on our hearts. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.